as we've been walking through First Peter, a major theme of his letter is on the theme of suffering. He is writing to instruct and to encourage Christians who are living in hard times. And when we think about Christmas, it's fitting. I'm gonna, there's going to be a tie-in, at least that's my, my hope and prayer, a tie-in this sermon to Christmas. At the end, when, you, when we realize that the setting in which The people of God found themselves when Jesus came at Christmas. It was a time of suffering. It was a time of darkness. It was a period of 400 years of silence. And then God broke in. God showed up. God affirmed His plan and His love to rescue and to redeem. And we get to see stories like that of Dom and his family being changed by Jesus. And that's still happening today. Anybody say amen to that? And so, and so Peter is writing to bolster and to encourage that the reality is because Jesus came, because he came, he came to undo suffering, and yet the way in which he would undo suffering is by suffering himself. And so even though he came to fix suffering, we find that it's not fully fixed yet. And if, if you weren't there last Sunday, you really need to go back and listen to Pastor Josh's sermon, What's the Point? Because the reality is we talk about and we sing about the good news of Christmas, hope and joy and love, and yet for many, many, many of us, and when we look around, you realize in this world it's still broken, it's not fixed yet, we still suffer. So what's the point? If the point is for God to bring us comfort, then we look around and we go, uh, we got a problem here. Right? Like, like this, this isn't, if the point is that all would be fixed and all would be well and all would be comforted, now, now my, my faith is unsettled because there's a lot of things that aren't right yet. There's a lot of things that aren't fixed yet. There's a lot of things that we will encounter. Well, Peter is going to write to instruct and encourage. So if you look, pick it up there in uh, chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to dive in. And my, my hope is that you'll see that it's possible for us to have hope and joy and and a faith in the midst of suffering, just as Peter's writing to his audience here. And and by the way, he's writing to uh, address a, a specific type of suffering. In this text, as we'll see, he's writing to those who who are suffering for their faith. Meaning because you believe this good news of Jesus, because you endeavor to live for God, because now you've been changed by Jesus and you, you're, you're laying sin aside and you're endeavoring to follow the Lord, but because of that very act, that very commitment of faith, you will find yourself suffering for Christ. And so Peter writes, verse 12, let's pick it up. Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. So the, the word there we see, at the fiery ordeal, literally, it, it is like, don't be surprised at the furnace that has come upon you, the furnace you're in. Now, if you recall the very beginning of, of uh, our series in First Peter, back in chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, Peter sets up his entire letter, and he says, in this you greatly rejoice, Though now, for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So he said, remember chapter 1, there's this refining, purifying fire. The word there literally in the Greek is the word perosis. It's where we get the word pure or purify in the English language. He's saying, don't be surprised when, when, because of this, fi- this refining furnace, this refiner's fire that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening. So the first word this morning for us, five words for Christians who suffer. The first is perspective. Perspective. Peter's writing to remind, to instruct, to encourage, to give Christians who suffer perspective. And he says, don't be surprised. Suffering isn't strange. Don't be surprised as though something strange were happening to you. As followers of Jesus, we we can look. We now have the advantage of history, of being able to look back. And we can see, even as Peter always connects the suffering of Christians to the suffering of Christ, we can see Jesus' suffering. 
We can see the apostles after him, how they suffered. We can look through the early church account. We can look through the history of the church and we see it suffering. We can even look around the world today in all parts of the world and see there are Christians real time who are suffering for their faith because they name the name of Jesus. Just this week, news in China of the communist regime cracking down on Protestant believers there being thrown in prison, house churches and uh, non-registered churches being shut down, being harassed, being imprisoned. So so here's the reality. We find ourselves in here in our context. Suffering isn't strange. You want to know what's strange? America's strange. (laughs) Not suffering for being a Christian is strange, right? This, this experiment of religious liberty and freedom that, that we still enjoy, and we'll, we, we, we don't want to see it slip, we don't want to see it slide, will it last? I don't know, but just recognize you live in a strange place. You, you know, I've walked in here this morning, we, we will, even with what we'll care, we'll walk around in our lives, and what's strange is not suffering as a Christian. In fact, it's it, not only strange, it might actually be dangerous. Listen to what Francis Schaeffer said. I believe that pluralistic secularism in the long run is a more deadly poison than straightforward persecution. Because I think it brings up the question, would you still follow Jesus if it cost you? I think it brings up the question, why have you come to Jesus? Why have you come to Jesus? If we come to Jesus because we think he'll give us a better life, if we come to Jesus because of the certain feelings he he gives us and he gets, then what happens when we enter into suffering and, and hardship. See, wh- why have you come to Jesus? Have you come to Jesus because if you think of all the amazing ways that he serves you or have you come to Jesus because of who he is and the call, the privilege to lay down your life and serve him because of who he is? It, 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 it's, it's like the question Pastor Josh put on the table last week. Would you be happy in heaven with all the blessings and benefit if God weren't there? See, the, the, the greatest foundation of our faith the devotion the commitment is not just because of the gifts and the blessings that we receive but it's because of who he is we get god because of who jesus is would you still follow him if it costs you your friends if it costs you your job your family your comfort your freedom peter's saying there's a perspective that we need to have as we move through this life. He says, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeal. You know, we we had the opportunity to uh, invite folks to come for prayer at the end of last week. And uh, it's incredible to see the reality of the things that we carry, the burdens that we carry. And I think it's, it's, I was telling Josh, the guys, as as I was preparing Friday, Saturday, I think this is like the seventh or eighth sermon on suffering that I've preached in the month of December. I was like, I've done a whole Advent series focusing on the redemption of, uh, of God's people out of slavery and suffering in, in Egypt. And, and in the, in the, back in the, even the Genesis series, we're walking through the, the story of Joseph and the suffering, how to come alongside those who are hurting, how to come alongside those who are going through hard times. Because the reality is, in light of the, the songs that we sing, I mean, the statistics are proven. We see it. December's a hard month. December, there, there are burdens upon people's hearts and lives as we reflect upon our lives, as we reflect upon our relationships. There are things that are distinctly and uniquely challenging and difficult about this time of year for many people. Some of you here in this room have lost loved ones in the last year, and you're facing the holidays for the first time. You're carrying... Burdens and to and to have the privilege of being able to come alongside and, and to and to and to pray for one another and to encourage one another and to lift one another up and, and not necessarily have it was interesting because in light of these things, these five words I'm gonna give you, I'm going, man, not all of these are necessarily the thing that you need to go tell your friend who's suffering. Okay, I'm gonna instruct us corporately about suffering, but 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 this is like I want to instruct our minds, but the reality is we'll get to it in the last point where I think the Lord wants to impact our hearts. The first thing Peter's wanting us to grab onto is this perspective. Are you prepared? 
to suffer. You say, you may not be in it now, but are you prepared? It would be strange if you didn't. In fact, in many ways, your faith will be deficient if you do not enter into, if you do not go through the fires of the refining fire of the furnace of whatever that is that God will bring to test and to refine and to purify and and remind, remember that the result of that is ultimately to be to the praise and to the glory of God. There's things to be gained in the midst of that. But this is the perspective that he wants us to have. Don't be surprised. Suffering isn't strange. Second word for us, Look at verse 13 through 16. But rejoice, Peter says. Don't don't be surprised as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice inasmuch, and he qualifies. He's not saying be happy that you're going through a hard time, be happy that you're suffering. No, he says rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. I call this the slingshot effect. To, 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 the, the more severe the suffering, the sweeter the victory. Right? When, when, when the more severe the struggle, the sweeter the outcome when it's revealed. And, and there's a sense in which as we enter into, as God sovereignly, uh, we'll talk about, you know, in the mystery of his will, whatever it is that comes into our lives, that he, the assignment he has for us to walk through, whatever that may be for you. As you enter that, as you walk through that, there is, a, there is an invitation, there's an opportunity. What's actually happening is you're getting the opportunity to participate in the sufferings of Christ. And, and do you, did, you, did you see how, how it turned out for him? Did you see the biblical pattern? Suffering precedes glory. Suffering precedes joy. You see, it's the setup. The, 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 the sojourn. The journey through the lowlands is the setup for the home where trouble and trial will touch you no more. But we're not home yet. So Christmas reminds us it's good for us to prepare for suffering and have the right perspective in the midst of suffering, but don't forget God is preparing a home for you. He's preparing a home for you. We're not home yet. But the house is being built. And, and, and there's a sense at which what we go through and travel through now is just setting us up for the sweetness of the ribbon-cutting day when he says, welcome in. Your rest has come. Your joy is here. And until then, look, at this is the word. I haven't even given you a second word. Here's the second word yet. Privilege. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Verse 14. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. For the Spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. A busybody. However, if you suffer as a Christian, again, the specific kind of, if you suffer for your faith, notice what he's doing there. He's giving, a, he's giving us several things. He's giving us a range of suffering from, from being insulted. That's a type of suffering, right? Being mocked, ridiculed, made fun of. Now, that's going to happen to those who live for, for Christ. And actually, holidays is a time where you might get that. I mean, you got that cousin, that brother, that uncle gives you a little, that little comment here, a little jab there about your faith in Jesus. Right? There, 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 might, there might be some of that that we experience. There's a range from, from, from the ins, being insulted, being harassed, being imprisoned, and four years after Peter writes this, he's crucified upside down. There, there's a range of suffering. So he says, however, if, verse 16, if you suffer as a Christian, this particular type of suffering, do not be ashamed. But praise God that you bear that name. It's a privilege. Don't be ashamed. If you suffer for Christ, don't be ashamed. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ. There's intimacy with Jesus and the agony of soul. There's intimacy, closeness with Jesus and the agony of soul. It's a privilege to bear his name. Now think about Peter is the one who's writing this. Don't be ashamed. Remember Peter's the one who denied him three times? 
I don't know the man. And Peter now, he goes, don't be ashamed if you bear that name. Rejoice in as much as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, knowing God's setting you up. There is joy, there is glory around the corner that will come. And you can draw strength from that now. You can draw hope from that now. But to should it be the Lord's will for you to suffer in this way, Peter's making it very clear, it's a privilege. See, I'm not saying it's easy. We're just we're looking at the Word of God. We're doing a little Bible study together here this morning. And, and it, Peter's saying this is a perspective that you need to have. Don't be surprised. And it's a privilege. Don't be ashamed. It's interesting that there's a kind of joy. The Christian faith of provides a kind of joy that can run parallel to suffering and even run underneath it and undergird it. This isn't the plastic, this isn't, this isn't saying, Peter's not saying don't grieve. He's saying rejoice in as much as you participate in Christ. He's, saying, he's not saying ignore and deny the reality of what you're facing or what you're going through. He's not saying you stuff it, deny it, stick your head in the sand. He's not, you know, all the other ways that we can respond to, 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 to trial and suffering and grief in this world. He's not saying that. He's, but he's saying there is a joy. There is an identification. There's a unity with Jesus that we can have. There's a sustaining presence and power that we can know. And actually, actually I think Peter's saying that's, that's what's strange. The suffering isn't strange, but, but experiencing this union, this intimacy with Jesus in the midst of suffering, that's strange, and that will cause the world to look around and look in and go, what in the world is that? It's good. What is that? What, is, what, is, what do you have that I don't have? He says, if you're insulted because of the name of, the Christ, of, the, because of, the name of Christ, you're blessed. So he says, rejoice, you're blessed, don't be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. What a privilege. Here, here, here's, 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 here's what this looks like, okay? Jesus suffered as your substitute. You now have the privilege of suffering as his representative. Jesus came to suffer as our substitute. Jesus suffered for sins once, for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. And now you have the privilege of bearing his name and going through the fire and knowing if this is how they treated him, this is how they'll treat you. It would be strange if they didn't. And the question is, will your faith become what God intends it to become? Will it shine the way it's intended to shine? Will you have the faith that will endure without it? That's a, that's a real question. It's a privilege to bear his name. Now, now I, I actually did a little, uh, a little word study in that word meddler because, because sometimes I see, this is going to be a little, little, little side note here, sometimes I see people doing things that they think is like, yep, I'm representing Jesus and you're actually just being a jerk. I, you, you could go back to Pastor Josh's message again, I don't know, a few weeks back when, um, and from chapter 3, Always set apart, you know, uh, Jesus says, Lord, be prepared to give an answer. There's things that we do. Sometimes we think, yeah, I'm representing Jesus, but actually it might be, we might be meddling. The word meddle, we think busybody, but it literally means to, to rudely or offensively insert yourself in others' affairs. And, and, and sometimes, by the way, when we think, oh man, I'm standing up for Jesus on Facebook, and we insert that comment, and we get a little bit of kickback, we think, oh, uh, just because I'm a Christian. It's like, no, actually, it, you may not have the anointing of suffering, you may just be annoying. Right, so in other words, we're not out there crusading, like sticking our, oh yeah, I'm standing up for Jesus now, oh, I'm getting, oh, I'm being persecuted. It's like, well, maybe. But when, when it's really coming down, when you're really being insulted because you've made, you, because you say, I wanna, I'm leaving sin and I want to live for Jesus, so I'm saying no to sin, and now you're taking heat for that and there's pressure coming on you. As, as Peter describes in the, in the passage above this, they think it's strange that you don't plunge with them into the sins that you used to plunge into anymore because you've left your life of sin. There may actually be some mocking and some insult and some pressure that comes 
because of the changes in your life and when, when at your workplace you don't go along with, with those things because you're wanting now to live for God, there may actually be this, some, some insult, some mockery, and he says, the spirit, right, you are blessed, the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Privilege. Privilege. Now, now notice again that it's a specific type of suffering. Suffering for the faith. He, notice he says, don't, don't suffer as a murderer, thief, criminal, or a, a meddler. Right? In other words, there's a kind of sin-inflicted or self-inflicted suffering. Uh, in fact, uh, Spurgeon said it this way, an ounce of sin will hurt you more than a ton of suffering. Meaning, meaning when you are suffering, you are vulnerable to temptation. You're vulnerable to, temp- you're vulnerable to, be, you know, to, to lash out in, in anger or in frustration or to seek escape. To seek comfort in something or someone other than Jesus for some immediate relief. So you're vulnerable in your temptation. So he says, if you suffer, don't, don't, don't reach for sin. That won't help. That will only compound your suffering. That will only comp- bring complexity into the situation. An ounce of sin will hurt you more than a ton of suffering. The Spirit of God will strengthen you and come upon you to enable you to go through the fire. Don't complicate it by sinning in your suffering or don't let sin be the cause of your suffering. He says, we, as followers of Jesus, we've reached that point where we say, enough. I'm, I'm no longer, right? My, our attitude is like Jesus. We, Jesus suffered once for sins. Let us not continue to suffer for sins. Instead, let's suffer for Him. Not for sins. Thirdly, so to our, our third word, look at verse 17. So perspective, privilege. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin with God's household. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, then what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? The, the word is purpose. Purpose. Again, you, we saw in, in, in verse 12 a little bit, don't be surprised the fiery ordeal that has come upon you to test you. Borrowing again from Peter's setup in chapter 1. This is a refining fire. There is purpose in suffering for the people of God. There's a kind of uh, a judgment that comes upon the God's house, which is, by the way, uh, one qualifying comment about this judgment. Don't be afraid. This is not a judgment unto condemnation. This is not punitive judgment for the people of God. It's purifying judgment. So we want to keep clear with this judgment in the house of God. It's purifying, but we, there is a warning here saying don't be fake. In other words, the fire comes upon to say, are you the real deal? Are you gold or are you fool's gold? See, this is why it can be, this is why it can be dangerous and, and, and not safe in, in sec and uh, pluralistic secularism versus straightforward persecution because what's the cost for your faith? Is your faith real? Have you come to Jesus for His sake, for who He is? Is He the one that you're trusting, that you're following, that you're clinging to? And what's the test? The test is, do you obey even when it costs you? Do you obey Him even when it's Hard. Do you trust him enough to obey him even if it leads to or means a kind of suffering or pain or loss in your life? So this is a purifying judgment because the reality is when you're on the right side of repentance, then you're on the right side of judgment. Being on the right side of repentance is being on the right side of judgment. This is, the, the, you know, suffering has... A unique ability to reveal and expose. But it doesn't only reveal and expose. It's Again, it's purifying, right? The, the, the process of refining metal, of refining precious metals. The heat and the fire causes the, the properties of the stone to be separated so that the precious metals which endure the fire and the dross and the ore and the things which do not endure the fire are burned away. And so the process is repeated until you have a more pure, worthy, 
result. And what remains is shinier, it's purer, right? Gold, silver. Not only does it reveal, not only does it expose, it purifies, and there are, I'll say, there are certain qualities that only get exposed, that only get revealed, that only get brought about in the life of a follower of Jesus through suffering. Um, I, I, heard, I don't know who said this. I heard it said one time, though, um, and I actually think it's good counsel, don't trust a Christian who doesn't walk with a limp. Because there's things that happen in your soul, in your life, in your character, in your faith that happen nowhere else as when you go through trial, suffering. There is a humility, there is a depth, there is a self-awareness, there is a compassion, there is a dependence, there is a a, a desperation, there it it pushes everything else that you thought was important, all that gets pushed to the side. You get to the core. What, what it, of trusting Jesus, of trusting God at a personal level. And there are things that only happen to our faith and in our lives when we are pressed. Proverbs says, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. There's purpose. Samuel Rutherford said, The great king keeps his wine in the cellars of affliction, not in the courtyard where the sun shines. Another Spurgeon quote, he said, They who dive in the sea of affliction bring up rare pearls. There's intimacy with Jesus in the agony of soul. And the good news is that the redemptive nature of suffering for those who are in Christ, the redemptive reality, it's, it's, it's the truth of Romans 8.28, and He causes all things to work together for good to those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. The reality is, as hard as it may be, the truth of the matter is, in Christ, in the sovereign, faithful, gracious hands of God, nothing is wasted. Things are burned away, but nothing is wasted, not even our suffering and pain. And the result can be a deeper quality of worship, a deeper quality of faith. Where does your hope and confidence lie? Who or what are you looking to? What is the rock bottom? Because, again, if we come to Jesus thinking He'll give us a better life or because of the feelings we get, then we are on shaky ground. We are on sifting sand. And what will you do when that is removed? What will you do when that is taken away from you? What will be revealed? It's time for judgment to begin with God's household. If it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel. Fourthly, look at verse 19. So then those, so then, this is kind of Peter's conclusion here of this section, so then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. So there's a perspective We're called to have. It's privilege to bear His name. There is purpose and design in what suffering brings about in the people of God. And fourthly, the call is to persevere. Now, I I wrote, I put persevere as opposed to perseverance. I wanted to put a verb. Not just the noun perseverance, which is true, but persevere. Because this this is a call to those who suffer according to God's will to commit themselves to commit themselves to the faithful Creator and continue to do good. Commit and continue. Persevere. Peter says, don't give up. You can persevere. In Philippians, when, we, when we, we come across the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 
That's actually not a verse talking about scoring a basket or catching a pass or getting in the end zone. It's talking about I can go through trials and suffering. I can, I've learned the secret to be content facing want, facing trial, tragedy, weakness. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so my word for you, if you're in suffering now to prepare your mind for suffering that is to come later, you can persevere in Christ. That's what you can do when he says, I can do all things through Christ who gets me. You can go through it. You, can, you would be amazed at the things that you can go through with Christ. Amen. You might not even know yet what would come out of you of what you can go through Christ because you haven't gone into it yet. But in that moment, if, when, when Christ is your trust, when he is your treasure, when he is the one that you're dependent on, you would be amazed at what you can go through. Mm-hmm. You can. You can persevere. You can persevere, and, and, it's, and, he's, and he's calling the brothers and sisters to commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. You commit and you continue because God is faithful. He says those who suffer according to God's will. Nothing befalls the Christian except that which has been sifted through the hands of God. That phrase, according to God's will. Again, don't let it be because of your sin, the the sin inflicted, the self inflicted. But there is a sovereign kind of suffering. By the way, there's also a satanic suffering that's very real. And so, another reason not to miss in a couple of weeks, December 30th, we're going to hear a message about spiritual warfare and how that relates to suffering and the faith of followers of Jesus. And so, there is self inflicted, sin inflicted, there is satanic oppression and suffering that come into our lives we have a real enemy who prowls around who wants to unsettle our faith which is why he doesn't take december off unfortunately right he doesn't take december off he presses in when we're vulnerable weak he moves in he does his thing but there is a type of sovereign suffering we don't have all the answers in the immediate context of why this why that but if you suffer according to god's will what is our response in the midst of it. And there are a lot of ways we could respond. There's a lot of ways that the world responds in, in, in trial and suffering. They throw the hands up and, and, and it can lead to depression and despair and it can lead to anger and bitterness and it can lead to uh, escapism and, and addiction and sin and it can lead to pie in the sky, head in the sand, thinking, oh, there's a silver lining around it, ignoring the reality of the pain of it and none of those are the responses of followers of Jesus. The resources in the gospel enable us to commit ourselves to a faithful creator, trusting him and continuing to do good, knowing that what has come into our lives has been sifted through the hands of a faithful Creator. Jesus said on the cross, into your hands I commit my spirit. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Christ did this for our sake and He alone enables us to do so for His. Into your hands. I commit my spirit. And, and Jesus in the Garden of, Geth- of Gethsemane dripped you know, sweat Uh, drops of blood and he said if it's possible take this cup from me yet not my will but yours be done and we have the privilege and the invitation to persevere and to follow in his steps at the at the at the core uh, dipping ahead to chapter five near the end of the letter Peter says, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, perspective, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. You can persevere and in due time God himself will restore and strengthen you. You see, that's verse 19. We're at the end. Well, there's, there's, one, there's one that I skipped over that I want to close with. The fifth word. So we've got perspective, privilege, purpose. What's the fourth one? Persevere. It's, you're getting five Ps today, okay? It's a preacher. Go back to verse 12. 
when Peter starts this section, he says, dear friends, but the word is actually beloved. The word is literally a form of of the word agape. The agape love of God. And this is what this is the, the fifth and final word I want to leave us with this morning. And I think it's, it's one that God wants to impress upon our hearts this Christmas season. And the word is precious. In Christ, you are greatly loved. As his children, you are precious in his sight. Peter is called the apostle of hope, and there's nothing that gives you hope in suffering like the love of God. Like knowing you're loved. Twice in 1 Peter, he says, beloved. Six times in 2 Peter. As Peter aged and matured, more and more he realized the reality of the love of Jesus, the love of God. There's one thing that you don't have to doubt this Christmas. There's one thing that you never have to doubt, no matter what you go through. You may not understand why. You may not understand when it will end. You may not understand how long it will last. But what you do not need to doubt is whether or not God loves you. Amen. He loves you. And Christmas is the proof that he didn't just say it, he sent it. Christmas is Emmanuel, God with us. The Word became flesh. In Christmas, God is inviting us, is calling us, is wanting us to experience his love. Literally, the Word became flesh. The Word became touchable, seeable, knowable. The love of God says, I'm not only going to tell you that I love you, I'm going to show you that I love you. I'm going to send my one and only Son, and He is the only God who ever suffered for His followers. We follow a Savior who suffered for us. There's no other Savior anywhere to be found like that. There's no other Savior who can actually save. No other Savior stepped in, entered in, and can look at you in your hour of suffering and say, I know. So the question, is his love enough? Is his love enough? You are precious to him. Part of what was so cool last week about being able to open up the altar for prayer, why we look forward to the day and we'll be able to do that every Sunday, every service. It's because you're carrying burdens. And you need to know that God loves you. When you come forward for prayer, you know, when we did that last week, we don't, you know, oh, no, there's a perspective God wants you to have. Oh, there's purpose in this. No. You put your hand, someone puts their hand on your shoulder, hears your need, says, I'm so sorry, and prays for Thank you, Father, that you love this person. And they encourage you and remind you that no matter what, you're, even if what you're going through doesn't change, even if it doesn't get better, even if it doesn't go away, even if it doesn't turn around, God is with you in the midst of it, and He loves you, and He's for you. And God now in His people, the body of Christ, wants His love to be experienced by the world touch of a hand. I don't know when or where or how this Christmas season it will happen for you, but I pray that you experience the love of God. I'm I'm not wanting your your faith to be grounded on certain feelings and an experience of emotionalism, but the truth is to be experienced. Theologically, that is rock solid. 
God wants you to experience the truth of his love. The word became flesh. Which means you are protected. You are secure. You can be assured. He will provide for you. He has not forgotten you. He has not abandoned you. He has not been caught off guard. He is not weak. He is not slow. He is not busy. He is not distracted. He is not surprised. Jesus even, or the scriptures even tell us, precious in his sight is the death of his saints. Even if it leads to death, you're still precious. You're still secure. His love is enough. Is Jesus enough for you this season? Is He enough? Is His love enough? Friends, you are precious. To him, in Christ, you are greatly loved. You do not have to doubt his love for you. He sent Jesus. He didn't just say it. He sent it. So, Father, I pray that as we respond, remembering no matter what we go through, Father, you have the last word. Whatever storms we face, Whatever waves come against us, Father, we can rejoice if those waves press us against the rock of ages. We can rejoice knowing that we have the privilege of bearing your name, of walking in your footsteps, of identifying with you. You who suffered as our substitute, Lord, should we be given the glory and the privilege of suffering as your representative, then Father, let us commit ourselves to you. Let us not lose sight of your faithfulness and let us continue being bolstered and upheld by your love. And so Father, I pray that your spirit would minister to each and every heart that is here in some way, somehow, some moment in the these coming days, Father, that your people would more deeply experience your love for them in a personal way, Jesus, knowing that you love them, that you came to earth, that they might know, that they might taste and see that you are good. And so, Father, draw our hearts into your love this season, I pray in Jesus' name.